Hello, my name is Sam Ord. I'm an ICU doctor at Nepean Hospital in Sydney. And in this lecture series on focused cardiac ultrasound, in this lecture we will be discussing uh, the assessment of pericardial fluid. Now, pericardial effusion is a relatively common finding and it's something that you will see uh, relatively often in the intensive care unit. One of the main things that we're looking for with assessing for pericardial fluid is trying to determine if there is signs of tamponade. And the most important thing that I'd like to emphasize is that tamponade is a physiological diagnosis. Echo is only going to support the diagnosis. In terms of physiological diagnosis, for me the most important sign is whether someone is short of breath, and that is always going to be in my first, uh, my first uh, uh, thing to assess as part of a tamponade assessment. We'd also be expecting to be seeing a raised JVP and hypotension as well. In terms of the amount of fluid that can cause tamponade, it can vary depending on the chronicity. Here on the uh, image on the left, we can see this is a rapid pericardial effusion. And in terms of the pressure that happens, it can ha happen at a lower volume. Uh, we also, we're getting cardiac tamponade physiology above a certain pressure. And this will happen at a lower volume when you have a rapid pericardial effusion accumulation, as opposed to a slow pericardial effusion. And the volume can be much higher. And you can have a litre of fluid, or sometimes even more, it can accumulate in the pericardial sac before you get tamponade physiology if it accumulates slowly enough. Fluid in the pericardial space can be caused by a number of things, and uh, a lot of these we are going to see in the ICU every day, such as infections, inflammation, renal failure, malignancy, it can be atrogenic from problems that can occur in the cath lab, it can be traumatic or even a hemopericardium from diseases such as aortic dissection. In order to assess the pericardial effusion, we need to look at it in multiple views. Because once again, we are dealing with a complex three-dimensional structure, which we are imaging with a two-dimensional imaging tool. So assessing this structure in, three view, in as many views as possible it is, is essential. We need to assess for chamber compromise because this is the underlying, uh, underlying sort of physiological principle of tamponade, where actually the pressure in the pericardial space becomes more than actually in chambers of the heart, hence you get collapse of the free wall of those chambers. And that can then lead to impaired filling of the heart, which then causes the significant decrease in cardiac output, which can be fatal. We need to consider differential diagnoses. There can be such things as loculated pericardial effusions, particularly after cardiac surgery. And even a small pocket can cause dramatic effects if it's in the wrong place. And so in your transthoracic imaging or focused cardiac ultrasound study, you can maybe not see any pericardial effusion, but we cannot assess every single pocket of the pericardium. It doesn't exclude it completely. Again, tamponade is a physiological diagnosis supported by echo. Just because you don't see any fluid doesn't necessarily mean that there's no uh, effusion because you can get loculated pericardial effusions. We've got to consider about pleural effusions. So again, the first port of call when you're seeing fluid around the heart is trying to consider where it is. Is it in the pericardium or is it in the pleural space? One of the best ways to differentiate this is using the aorta in the parasternal long axis view. And in the parasternal long axis view, there's this circular descending aorta that's sitting just behind the heart. If you have fluid in front of the descending aorta, that is pericardial effusion. If you have fluid behind the aorta, that is a sign of a pleural effusion. Particularly in sort of the obese, uh, you can see a fat pad. Now a fat pad will typically sit in front of the heart and it can have a heterogeneous appearance. So it doesn't look completely clear like a fluid structure and it can have a sort of uh, a slight heterogeneous appearance and uh, it is best seen in the uh, posterior, uh, is best seen in the parasternal long axis view. So I'll show you examples of each of these. So this is an example of a pericardial and a pleural effusion. 
So here this is the parasternal long axis view. We have the right ventricle, we have the left ventricle, we've got the LVOT going up into the ascending aorta through the aortic valve, we have the mitral valve here, and the left atrium. Now we have one line down here which is the pericardium, and in front of it we're seeing our pericardial fluid. And what I'm asking you to look at in particular is the descending aorta, the circle, circular descending aorta that's sitting behind the heart. And in front of it, we have the pericardial effusion, which is where the pericardium is going just in front of it. But posterior to it, if you imagine posterior to the uh, descending aorta, we have the pleural effusion. How about a fat pad? So looking again in our parasternal long axis view, we have our right ventricle, our left ventricle, maybe with slightly thickened walls, but we'll make sure that we're imaging it on plane. Here's the left ventricle outflow tract, aortic valve into the aorta, and here's the left atrium. And firstly, we look at our descending aorta, and in front of it, we can't see any clear fluid, excuse me, we can't see any clear fluid structure that is sitting in, in front of the aorta. But what we can see at the front is that we have this echogenic structure that is sitting there just in front of the heart. And it looks like there's an echo-free space in that pericardium, sitting just in here, in front of the pericardium here. We'd have a look in this area in front of the right ventricle. But it has a speckled appearance. With a lack of, uh, a lack of an effusion behind the heart here, we'd be saying that this is most likely a fat pad. If you do see fluid around the heart, it's important to try and make an estimate about whether you think it is small, medium, or large in size. And the way that you can try and assess this is by measuring the largest echo-free space at end diastole. Now, physiologically, we can have 10, 20 mils of fluid that sits in the pericardial space. So sometimes you see fluid as part of a normal study. But typically, that fluid you're going to see is only at end systole. You're going to see a separation between the pericardium and the myocardium. If you see an echo-free space throughout the cardiac cycle surrounding the heart, which is less than 10 millimeters, and its largest echo-free space at end diastole, that would be indicative of a small pericardial effusion. A medium pericardial effusion, 10 to 20 millimeters in size, and a large would be greater than 20 millimeters. And particularly when you're getting into the, uh, large, uh, the large pericardial effusions, you can see the heart that swings in the pericardial space. And I'll show you some examples of that. So I'll ask you to have a look at this example. So here we can see one of the great ways to start off doing a study if you're aware of a pericardial effusion is to increase the depth down. And this way we can make a decent assessment between whether we're looking at a pericardial effusion or a pleural effusion. And we can see that there's a large hypoechoic distance surrounding the heart. And this is what a swinging heart looks like. You see it's sort of moving around in that pericardial fluid. You can see the descending aorta and the pericardial effusion is in front of it. So therefore pericardial effusion, not plural. In the short axis view, again, it gives you an idea of this swinging heart and we can see the circumferential nature to this pericardial effusion. The same in the apical four-chamber view. We've got the left, left ventricle and left atrium. We've got the right ventricle and right atrium. And we have the heart swinging around in that large echo space. One of the important things to start assessing if you're concerned about tamponade physiology and pericardial fluid is whether the IVC is dilated or not. We'll just touch on this later, but it is very important to try and make an estimate of what that IVC size is and how it varies with respiration. In terms of measuring the size, you can either just pause the, uh, uh, pause the image and just measure it out to end diastole and make the measurement, or you can do it more, uh, more accurately with M mode. I typically like to do this in a short axis plane. So in this imaging plane, we drop the uh, M mode cursor line, try to bisect that left ventricle as accurately as we can, and then put the M mode on. And here we can then see the maximum diameter, excuse me, the arrow is in the wrong place, the maximum diameter, which is uh, sitting here at uh, during diastole, and the maximum diameter between the pericardium and the right ventricle free wall, which is greater than 20 millimeters, suggesting this is a large pericardial effusion. 
This would be an example of a moderate pericardial effusion, where you wait till end diastole and you make the measurement in end diastole, and here it's between 10 and 20 millimeters, suggesting this is a moderate pericardial effusion. In terms of using echo to diagnose cardiac tamponade and to uh, confirm the, your physiological diagnosis, you must remember that the size of the effusion does not equal tamponade. If you have a chronicity to the uh, accumulation of the fluid, uh, a large volume of fluid can be uh, tolerated very well. Tamponade is again a physiological or clinical diagnosis. For me, it's in particular it's shortness of breath, uh, as well as a raised JVP and hypotension. An echo can help uh, confirm the diagnosis, but it certainly isn't going to be able to diagnose it by itself. To make the diagnosis for tamponade, you must be assessing for chamber collapse. And it's all about the chamber collapse of that right ventricle free wall where the pressure in the pericardium is greater than intra, uh, intra chamber or interventricular or intra uh, atrial chambers uh, pressures. And that's what will cause the collapse. That will cause the decrease in the preload, which is what's going to cause the hypotension. And if we look at this, uh, uh, these pressure curves for both the left ventricle and the right ventricle, it's whenever the pressure is at its lowest point, at its nadus, that the uh, pericardial pressure, once it gets above a certain level, will cause the chamber to collapse. And in this regard, I'll ask you just to look at this right ventricle pressure. And we see that its pressure is at its lowest during diastole. So therefore, we see, in particularly in late diastole, we see the right ventricle free wall collapse. In, uh, for the right atrial pressure, we get an idea that the right atrial pressure is its lowest, maybe towards end systole or early diastole. And it's typically during these phases in uh, late systole or early diastole that you get right atrial chamber free wall collapse. And these, along with the assessment of the IV size, can help us make that diagnosis to support uh, a physiological or clinical diagnosis of tamponade. In terms of measuring the timing for this, again, you can use M mode or just pause your image and uh, scroll through it slowly. In this example of the uh, of this uh, example with the large pericardial effusion, we can see that we get just a little bit of a collapse of that right ventricle free wall. And here, you can see that it's happening from the timing of the ECG, which is again why it's important to attach ECG leads when you're, uh, when you're doing these studies, we can see that we're in diastole. So diastole is from the, beginning, uh, from the end of the T wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. And we can see that we're getting right ventricle free wall collapse during uh, mid to late diastole. In terms of uh, assessing the, uh, the chamber collapse, I said that it's not absolutely uh, confirms the presence of tamponade. You could have that picture that I just showed you, but that patient could have chronic renal failure and be walking around going to work. It all depends on the chronicity of the problem. And that's why we have different sensitivities and specificities for different uh, chamber collapse. In particular, it's important to assess the right atrium and right ventricle, but you can get the left atrium that can collapse as well. In terms of the sensitivity and specificity, we can perform a, a positive likelihood ratio. And a positive likelihood ratio less than five does not significantly modify the likelihood of the tamponade diagnosis. And here we can see with right atrial collapse, it's got a 92% sensitivity, but only a specificity of about 80%. From the right ventricle, it's only got a sensitivity of about 50%, but a specificity of 90%. In terms of the IV dilation, it's got a sensitivity of 97%, but a specificity of only 66 with a low positive likelihood ratio. But you put these things together, and that's how you start making that assessment of whether you really do have uh, the, whether you really do have the uh, tamponade uh, as diagnosed on physiological or clinical diagnosis. The importance of that IVC diameter assessment is because it can help you say whether there is true tamponade versus hypovolemic tamponade. Now here we've got an example of true tamponade where we see this dilated IVC that's greater than 21 millimeters in dimension and has minimal inspiratory collapse. And that all helps me, that all helps tell me that there is some kind of impairment to right atrial uh, filling which means that you have a large IVC diameter. And that's how you increase the likelihood of the supporting diagnosis of tamponade.
mentioned there are other chambers that can collapse. And this is an example where you can see in the apical four chamber view, we can see the left atrial free wall can also collapse. And here you can see it in the parasternal long axis view. Again, this large pericardial effusion potentially, we can see quite a, uh, you know, we can see an echo free space and potentially that might be quite significant. That does not necessarily mean that this patient has tamponade. And something like this can be particularly well tolerated. Just because you see free will collapse, that does not make the diagnosis. In terms of uh, a loculated pericardial effusion, you can, as I said, you can particularly see these postoperatively. And here we can see that there's not circumferential fluid, but there is just circumferential, there is just a, a loculated effusion sitting there behind the right atrial wall, and it's causing some significant uh, impairment to that right atrial free wall function. And that in itself can cause a tamponade physiology by preventing decent inflow into that right ventricle. I'm going to end up by this example. I uh, ask you to have a look at this example to a 56-year-old man who presented to the ED with sudden onset of chest pain and some hypotension. As part of your assessment, you do a focused cardiac ultrasound, and these are your images. So what we can see in this parasternal long axis view is the right ventricle maybe looks a little generous in size. We've got the left ventricle that is probably contracting OK. It is certainly not severely impaired. Left atrium looks normal in size. And then we look at the pericardium. And sitting at the back here, we can see this posterior wall of the, of the left ventricle. But sitting behind it, we have this heterogeneous structure that is sitting in the pericardial space. In our short axis view, again, we get a suggestion that there's a generous size to the right ventricle. But the left ventricle looks like it has a reasonable contractile function. But sitting at the back, again, we've got this heterogeneous structure that's sitting in the pericardial space. And this is a gentleman who had hemopericardium. And it's important to differentiate this from a fat pad. Obviously, it's sitting posteriorly. We can't see it anteriorly. You've got to put it into clinical context with someone who has sudden onset of chest pain and hypotension. And we'd assess, uh, we'd assess with our focused cardiac ultrasound leads a significant abnormality that would certainly change our management of this patient and arrange for ur urgent imaging, for example, or even considering surgery or a transesophageal echo. So in summary, again, just to say the point again, that tamponade is a physiological or clinical diagnosis. Echo only supports the diagnosis, and it does not make it just on the echo alone. You must make sure that if you are seeing chamber collapse, you are also looking at the IVC to ensure that there is true tamponade physiology. Because maybe with fluid loading, if you see a small collapsing IVC with some fluid loading, you could potentially increase up the pressures intracardially, and that will maybe help uh, prevent some of the uh, tamponade physiology that you're seeing. It may not mean that you don't have to drain this effusion, but it may buy you some time. The size of the effusion does not equal tamponade. You can have large pericardial effusions, and they can, uh, they can be tolerated extremely well if they have accumulated over time. We are dealing with a complex three-dimensional structure that we are imaging with a two-dimensional imaging tool. You've got to make sure that you're assessing that structure in as many views as possible to try and accurately assess the size of the pericardial effusion. And again, you're measuring it end diastole, the maximum echo free space. And finally, assess for chamber collapse, particularly the right atrial and the right ventricle free wall. And along with the IVC, that can help give you a good positive ratio, likelihood ratio, to assess for whether tamponade is really causing the problem. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you found that useful.